let's talk about sparsity. Usually in a neural network, an input layer is connected to an output layer with a fully connected dense layer. Effectively, that means that every input is connected to every single output. However, what you can also do is you can say, well, let's not do a fully connected layer. Let's instead introduce a sparse layer. When you compare both approaches, you could argue that maybe this layer has more capacity to learn and that there are more patterns that it could be picking up. In this case, you can argue that, sure, the layer is more lightweight, but you can wonder if the capacity for learning has also decreased. It might surprise you to learn, however, that inside of Raza, many of our machine learning models actually prefer the sparse option. And in the base configuration, we drop as much as 80% of all the weights. It might also surprise you to learn that it seems that dropping all of these weights doesn't affect performance. In Raza, we drop a fixed random set of weights before and throughout the training of our neural networks. So we're not doing any pruning in hindsight or depth of connections or anything. We really are dropping weights from the get-go. So what I want to do in this video is explain how Raza uses this sparsity. And I would also like to show you the results of a benchmark that demonstrate that this is indeed something that's beneficial. Note that I'm presenting work today that's done by my colleague Johannes and by my colleague Vladimir. To help explain this effect of sparsity, let's consider the transformer block. This is a common component in many of our algorithms in Raza. In particular though, this is a component that we use in our diet architecture. That, that will be the architecture that we use to predict intents and entities. If you're unfamiliar with the transformer block, I highly recommend you go back a couple of episodes in our series where we explain how the block works. If you're already familiar, let's zoom in on just the multiplications that are happening. We have our input layer over here, and that gets turned into keys, queries, and values. These are all just numeric representations, but the transformation happens here. There's a fully connected dense layer over here. In fact, we have multiplications happening here with multiple heads. So that allows us to think about how many weights are actually being trained here. We have three multiplications happening here. Each node has four heads. And in the base setting, we would have a shape of 256 going in here and we'd have the same shape going out. So that leaves us with about 65,536 weights for just the part over here. We would have something similar for the three dense layers that you see over here. So I'll add that as well. This brings us to a grand total of 983,040 weights that we are training for just this one transformer block. Here's where you can start asking yourself a very good question. Do we really need all 983,040 weights here? It might be the case that we can say, well, you know, we, if we just drop one of these weights and set it to zero, there's barely going to be an effect because there's still a lot of information left in all of the other weights. But then you start wondering, well, what happens if I drop two weights or any general number n? We could maybe do something of an experiment where we say, you know what, on the x-axis, I have the total number of weights that I am training inside of my transformer block. And on the y-axis over here, I can say, well, what's the F1 score of all of my intent predictions? And you can imagine that the shape of this chart might look something like this. In this beginning moment over here, it certainly feels plausible that when we add more weights, we're going to be able to learn more. But it also feels safe to say that at some point we're going to hit a saturation moment. Given that we have almost a million weights, there has to be this point in time where adding more weights might not add extra benefit to the system anymore. 
So let's now discuss a benchmark that we can do. When you look at a transformer block like this one, then I can argue for two hyperparameters that we might want to tune. The first one is the connection density. That is to say, how many connections do we still leave intact, putting everything else to zero? The other hyperparameter is the transformer size. And that represents how big this input size and also these intermediate states are going to be. The amount of connections that we will have in all of our layers will depend on both of these two numbers. We're going to be checking how good our F1 score is. This is a weighted average between precision and recall. And we're going to be checking that out on a internal data set that we like to call Sarah. This is the assistant that you may have seen on our documentation page. We're going to be running diet and we're going to be checking how good our intents are going to be performing based off of this F1 score. And what you're about to see is a chart. On the X axis, we have the number of weights. And again, on the Y axis, we will have our F1 score, but we are going to draw multiple lines. This, for example, is the line that we might have for a connection density of 10%. And this line would have a couple of points on it. And the X values that we see on these points will be determined by the transformer size. There will also be some other lines. Maybe this one is the one for 20% connection density. And again, we would have a couple of XY coordinates on this line. And it's important to just observe that the reason why we have points here is because we're also varying the transformer size. Having said all of this, here's what the benchmarked chart looks like. So what are we looking at here? Well, let's first take a look at this green line. This green line belongs to a connection density of one. So that means that all the layers in our transformer block are just fully connected. We're not dropping anything. When you look at the green line, you can see that we ran the experiment a couple of times with different seed values and, you know, there's a little bit of a margin for error. But having said that, it seems like we get an F1 score of about 84% at the end over here. And in this situation, we have many weights indeed. Note that the X axis over here is on a logarithmic scale. Let's now look at this connection density of 20%. That would be the orange yellow line. If I were just to look at that line, I might be able to argue that all the yellow points over here definitely seem competitive with all the green points over here. It doesn't seem like we are losing a whole lot in our F1 score, but if I just look at how many weights I'm actually using on the x-axis here compared to over here, it is a massive difference. It certainly feels safe to say that we may not be losing a whole lot once we go lightweight. The thing that's most interesting, at least to me, is that this also seems to be holding true when we really drop down the connection density. This arc over here represents the largest transformer size with a connection density of one. This arc is again, the largest transformer size, but with a connection density of 20%. And if I now go lower and lower over here, then if I look at the Y axis, they all seem to be around the 84%. It's not like I'm losing a lot of accuracy here. But if I now look down at the X axis, it makes a huge difference. And this is pretty interesting. It seems that if we go for a large transformer size, we seem to have something of a saturation point when it comes to our connection density. We need to remain aware though that if the transformer size is low, that then we do start seeing bigger differences. But still, this is massive. This is two orders of magnitude difference that we're talking here, while the F1 score remains the same. And that is quite interesting. We do have to be careful though. What I've just shown you is the chart for intent prediction using diet, but we're obviously also interested in other tasks. Here you see the chart for entity prediction on the same data set with diet. And here you see the chart that's predicting the next action. The next action is predicted with another algorithm, one that we call TED, but TED also uses the same transformer block. When you look at these last two charts, then it seems that we might need to be a bit more careful. 
suddenly if we are in the lower bounds of trainable weights, it becomes clear in the TED use case that we're definitely losing some accuracy. And something similar can also be said here for our entity predictions. So that means that we probably don't want to set our connection density to values that are much lower than 20%. But in general, looking at this benchmark, it does seem like this yellow line, which is the line that refers to a connection density of 20%, that that's actually a fair balance. It really does seem like we don't need fully connected layers in our transformer blocks. And that is also why this is the standard hyperparameter setting for all of our algorithms inside of Raza. These values have been picked intentionally, but the main thing that's kind of amazing to consider is just that we can usually make do with less weights. And that's a very useful observation in general.